Good evening. Welcome to what we've, come to what we've come to call the Virtual Temple MICA, broadcasting to you through your local YouTube station on your computer into your home, straight from our homes into your home. This evening, we are having our second panel discussion where we are be learning about the pandemic. A couple of weeks ago, we had medical experts. This year, we are going to think about and hear about and learn about how the media is forming uh, the way we consider the pandemic through media coverage and journalism. Uh, our moderator for this evening is once again, David Scorton. So thank you, David, for being our moderator once again. David is the president of the American Association of Medical Colleges. Uh, the two panelists and all three of these wonderful people who are giving to us so generously of their time are members of the MICA community. We have with us also Elizabeth Bumiller of the New York Times. Uh, Elizabeth is the um, uh, the head of the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. I did not bother to look up the exact language from her bio because I know these people so well. And uh, David Gregory is with us also uh, this evening. Uh, David is a well-known television journalist and currently is a political analyst for CNN, which many of us spend too many hours watching these days. So we will all have a chance, we'll have a chance to um, ask our own questions. David Scorton will begin uh, the conversation and begin the questioning with our panelists, but you're also invited to send in your questions. Just type in the questions and then <coughs> in the evening, we'll be feeding them on to David Scorton. We'll end the evening uh, with some music as a Micah uh, tradition and a prayer. So thank you so much to our panelists and I'm passing the ball now over to you, David Scorton. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you in advance, Elizabeth and David, to subject yourselves to questions that you don't even know are coming yet. It's great to see you here. And it's great to know that the Temple Micah congregation is coming together again to discuss and think about and experience together more about this unprecedented crisis that we're in, the COVID-19 pandemic. But whereas last time we talked about uh, science and epidemiology and virology, um, I was thinking that where do most of us get our information in general and specifically during a time of crisis like this? And if you're like me, you get most of your information from journalists, even though I read medical journals, Still, the way that I get information that's been uh, correlated, checked, and brought together with other information is from journalists. And so the first thing I want to do is not really ask a question, but just make a statement to Elizabeth and David. And this is to you and to all of the journalists standing behind you all over the world. I am very, very grateful, as is everyone I know, that the profession of journalism exists, because that's where we're getting our information. And despite things you may hear otherwise, you are very, very much appreciated. And even in technical fields, as I mentioned, where some of us may read trade journals or spe specialty kinds of publications, we're getting most of our information from you. And I give you a very, very hearty thank you on behalf of myself, the congregants, and really on behalf of the American people, if I might be, be so bold. Now, some people have described in days gone by, uh, journalism as the so-called fourth estate. And where that comes from, there's an argument, uh, even in the Oxford English Dictionary about when that phrase first occurred. But hundreds of years ago, the three estates in the UK were clergy, nobility, and commoners. And somehow uh, journalism was taken to be the so-called fourth estate. And although clergy, nobility and commoners in that order were felt to be very, very influential. The journalists themselves were felt to be what we now call influencers. And that certainly has multiplied in our day. The phrase, the fifth estate um, in my heyday in the sixties was added to indicate uh, renegade kinds of coverage that perhaps now we think about as taking the whole range of things like social media and the many, many, many other areas uh, that, uh, th that affect our thinking. So um, thinking uh, about uh, this general issue of where we get our information, the first question I want to ask you two is separate from research that you're doing for reporting, separate from your own reporting, where do you get your information every day? And perhaps we could start with you, Elizabeth. 
but where I also get my information aside from the New York Times. Well, I get it from CNN. I get it from MSNBC. I get it from the Washington Post. We get three. We still get three newspapers delivered to our house: the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. We're unique on the street. Um, the uh, uh, I get it uh, from the Atlantic, uh, from the New Yorker. Those are the things I read. Um, that, and then um, I do occasionally watch Fox because not for information, but mostly to see. Uh, what is going on in the other universe, you know, and it's important to see because the president watches it and you can sort of usually tell what's going on in his head by what's going on in Fox. So that's the main place I get my information. But, you know, our reporters in the Bureau at the Times talk to a huge range of people. So that's my primary source of information. I can't hear you. Uh, thank you so much, David. <laughs> Just hi, everybody in the, in the MICA community and beyond. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the same. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I'll also listen to podcasts um, and the New York Times has uh, one of the best. Um, and, you know, it, it's really, we'll get into this more a little bit, but I mean, it's a tribute to the Times and there are some others that have been able to reorient themselves in a new digital age to be as strong as they are in these moments that they can not just survive, but thrive. And we can get into that in the business of the media that's being challenged right now. So podcasts are some and, and social media to varying degrees. I mean, I have found that my appetite for social media has actually diminished during this because there's so much invective. Um, there are times when it can be useful to kind of test the waters a little bit. Uh, to get some information. Um, but, uh, you know, I've also found this time to be really useful to read a lot. I mean, I'm a big reader anyway, and uh, but, but I have uh, probably more time than Elizabeth does, given her job. And so I read a lot. I've been reading a lot about World War II, reading a lot about uh, the 90s and our politics, and trying to put some of this into the context of other crises that we have faced, including, you know, Elizabeth and I became pals um, in, on 9-11, not exactly on 9-11, on September 14th to be exact, when we traveled together and met each other for the first time when we were with President Bush at Ground Zero. So some of that context around other crises I, I find to be um, helpful right now. That's very interesting. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Elizabeth, that at our home, we, we have the same newspapers. Plus, I look, I read online some conservative uh, publications as well to try to get a little better feel. So now I want to go one layer deeper, if I might, and ask you, um, as very well-read and well-rounded people, still, when reporting on or thinking about something as technical as the pandemic, it must be a stretch. And so I'm curious, where do you get your information so you feel on steady ground? Uh, David, maybe you could kick this one off about such a technical topic. Well, I think both as citizens and as journalists, um, you know, you, you have in the ranks of journalism, whether it's on TV or, uh, or in print, you have people whose beat it is to cover science. Um, you know, Don McNeil at the Times, uh, Sanjay Gupta and others at CNN. So, you know, there's that level of expertise in the, in the repertorial core. Aside from that, I mean, listening to public health experts, I think one of the things that's challenging in these times is to be a discerning consumer of information because we have a lot of information, we don't have a lot of knowledge. So um, I'm surprised even in my, my circle of friends and in my family circle, how much paranoia there is, conspiracy theories and whatnot, because people are not actually paying close enough attention to what the experts are. So I find that the first thing to do if I'm analyzing any of this is to stick to what I know and what deeper information I can glean by covering public officials and not trying to get into the science or the medicine. Um, and I can have some expertise just as somebody, you know, like anybody else going through this feeling restrictions and being uncertain about what we don't know. Um, so, but, but I think the big piece is, are we, are we paying attention to the right people? And are we really being thoughtful about where we're getting information? I think that's as important for us um, as uh, journalists or analysts as it is for citizens. I would say, if anything, it's more important because we're depending on you as a transducer of that information. Elizabeth, what about, what about you? Where do you get your technical? Well, 
chops. Well, chops. from the time science department, uh, the science <laughs> department reporters, um, they have been working overtime. What's interesting about this story for us is that, you know, I was saying to one of the uh, editors in New York today that, you know, for three years, the Washington Bureau has basically run, been the story. We have, you know, about the Trump administration. And what has changed now is that the story is now encompasses the entire paper. It's not just the Washington Bureau anymore. It is the science department. It is international because obviously this virus started overseas. It is um, a, a biz day, which is covering the economic fallout. Uh, it is the national desk, which is covering um, uh, what is happening in all the states. So that's um, so that's good. Um, we're um, we're all working really long hours. What's so strange about being home is that um, I'm just <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm working all the time and I'm home, you know. So, uh, but that's a whole other conversation. But I so I really do rely on our science editor and our science reporters, Donald McNeil, um, David mentioned, and uh, Gina Colada and Katie Thomas. These are people who know about testing, about drugs, the pharmaceuticals. They know about um, they know about the CDC, you know, an agency we didn't really cover very much. Um, so that is where I learned a great deal. And right now, for example, um, just to show you how it works, um, the Trump is doing his two hour, you know, mega briefing as usual right now. And we always have the White House reporters are, you know, watch them, we cover it as news, you know, as if there's news, but we always have science reporters watching now because sometimes when you have Dr. Deborah Brooks come up or Dr. Fauci, they start talking and we're saying, uh, you know, we just don't know exactly what they're saying. And like the other night, for example, um, when they were making all those claims about testing and that there was capacity in all these different states, it was like, what are they saying? So we have to rely on the, on the people in the science department who cover, who know this. To, to do a sort of a truth squatting on it. Can I interject on this point? Because I think it's really yeah. interesting in kind of in the historical context. You know, what Elizabeth is describing, and I think the Times has done a really good job of not, um, they, they're not sending, correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, but you guys aren't sending reporters to all of these briefings. You can monitor them. You don't need to be in the crowded briefing room. Right. Briefing room that's a little news back. Right. Little news back. Cable news is obviously. Cable news is obviously. Covering these wall to wall, whether there's news or not, and there's a lot of argument in there, uh, especially from the president. And what's interesting to me is that there's this mix. I mean, we are in a in a point where we crave facts. We just want to know what's happening, what is the danger level, and where is this going. There's of course politics mixed into this as well. There's the the economy, but there's also this question of accountability, and whether you're covering you know, Hurricane Katrina, or you're covering a response to 9-11, there's a certain amount of, hey, I hope the government does well, we're all banding together, but then there's also, did you get this wrong? You know, we can have debates about whether the media, especially in the briefing room, gets too focused on the accountability question. You know, did you minimize this? And I think there's a certain amount of antagonism toward the president on this question. But, you know, if you think about different times in our history, during World War II, for example, you didn't have as much of that accountability because of the censorship that went on, there weren't big questions asked about how the campaign was going in Italy because you didn't know what was really happening until well after the fact. So I think that's an interesting dynamic about uh, the instantaneous nature of media today that has the ability to inform and to scrutinize in the very same way. So we can have a whole conversation about those briefings because we've been, um, you know, we stopped sending reporters to them because we decided it was not worth the health risk. Although Peter Baker, when our chief White House correspondent, he went last week, I believe, because he had pulled, it was his responsibility. He was the White House pool reporter that day and you have a responsibility to your colleagues. So he went, but I, I just think that, um, you know, this is a whole conversation. Trump uses them just as a, uh, I mean, he needs that. He needs the bullying and back and forth with reporters. He craves that. Right. And I just don't think it right. makes anybody, I mean, Reporters hold their own really well. They ask good questions, but you're just at an inherent disadvantage when the president of the United States is up there standing up at the podium and you're sitting in the seat and you can't, at some point you have to stop pushing back. You know, as you know, well, you've been there, right? I mean, you were, you know, as a, you know, it's really hard to argue with the president of the United States and extensively, uh, if you're a reporter, you end up looking pretty bad, um, even though, I think they're they're asking really good questions and they're being really tough, but it's just an inherent inequality there. 
I agree, and I think that the president ultimately seizes on it. I do think there's an yes. important piece of it that's worthwhile, which is the kind of process you want to see him getting pushed. But I do think the totality of it is that we're not, you know, we're not getting out of it what Americans should get out of it, which is let's hear from the public health uh, officials. You know, I feel so much better hearing from Vice President Pence on some of the facts than some of the pushback. In the president, you're caught up in this miasma of, you know, of testing without context and, you know, a, a lot of his pronouncements. So I think there's no question that it's much more propaganda than it is real value. Yeah. You know, I'll give you a, a yeah. little different perspective just, just uh, for your interest. So um, I, I do watch the briefings. I also have direct contact with members of the task force separately. And then, uh, of course, a lot of contact being a physician and heading this organization with sub sub specialists who work in those areas. I'm a cardiologist. I don't know the first thing about all this other stuff. I can sort of read through the medical journals, but we have experts at our hands. And I must say that um, if parsed a little bit, there is some very useful information that comes across to me in the White House, but it's usually from the people who are giving you some facts about this or that. And once you move into the policy realm, then it becomes much more political, at least, at least from, my, from my point of view. So it's interesting that you two met uh, uh, just a short time after 9-11, because it brings me to my next question, and that is, um, I've always thought about journalism and being a Northwestern grad and uh, Medill School being such a, such a very famous, vaunted place, and we interacted a lot with journalism students on campus. I've always thought that it was a, a learned profession, a very important profession, but I also came to see it as a dangerous profession. So if you're covering a pandemic at the source, at the front lines, you're taking a chance on being exposed to the pandemic. If you're in a war zone, if you're doing foreign correspondent type of reporting, you're putting yourself on the line. So to what extent do you believe that journalism is a, is a dangerous career, actually personally dangerous? Um, well, it certainly can be depending on what you cover. I was, when I was covering the Pentagon, uh, I uh, embedded with Marines in Helmand province in Afghanistan. And um, I don't even pretend I'm a war correspondent. I was terrified the entire time I did it, but I, it was, um, you know, I sort of took what I thought were uh, acceptable risks, but I don't know, you know, but, but uh, you, you make your own choice. I mean, people who are war correspondents have made that choice. It was not a choice I wanted to make except for a couple of stories I did uh, in, in, uh, when I was covering the Pentagon. Um, I also, um, and, and I think now, you know, Sherry Fink, who is a doctor, you may know of her, he was also a Times reporter, mm -hmm. you know, went into a hospital and embedded in a hospital in Brooklyn, just like I embedded with the Marine. She embedded with the hospital staff in Brooklyn and got this, these tremendous important stories, but God, she, you know, she was, you know, she was putting herself at risk. Um, again, she determined, I, I haven't spoken to her about it, but she obviously determined it was an acceptable risk, but um, it's just, you know, it's something you, you, you make, you make the decision on your own. Obviously those of us in Washington covering the White House or the, 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 um, the Congress, you know, these are not risky jobs, except they make you crazy. But, but, um, uh, you know, but it's, a, there's a certain breed of, uh, war correspondent who who um who thrives on that who does really well i can think of a couple war photographers i know so um it's a dangerous profession if 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 you make it that if that's the what kind of journalism you want to do and i have nothing but admiration for war correspondents me too yeah. Yeah. Same, same same here uh, so much admiration and i've made different choices in, in my career it's interesting early on i wanted to be a foreign correspondent and mm. And I knew early on that I wanted to be a dad and, and a husband. And I got to know foreign correspondents in television and got some insight into their life, uh, their divorces, you know, when they would call their children from some far flung land and try to read them a story over a, a satellite phone. And, and I knew uh, in my 20s that that was not for me. So I made a different choice. But it's, it's incredible the, the notion of if you're going to know, you have to go and how many correspondents. Um, do that and and put themselves at risk, whether it's in conflict or if it's on the, um, the front lines of disease. I mean, I think of Nick Kristoff at the Times, um, who did an amazing piece 
um, being at a uh, at a hospital embedded for a shorter period of time, you know, in an ICU ward. So it, it, we're better for that kind of journalism, but it's uh, it's tough work for sure. Now I'm keeping an eye on the uh, questions coming from our congregants, our fellow congregants, and uh, one came up that superimposed one of the questions I was going to ask. So I'm going to bring it up. Not knowing if people are comfortable being called out, I won't tell you who asked the question, but it's one of our friends and colleagues in the synagogue. So you were talking, both of you, about the enormous, especially Elizabeth was talking about taking over the whole newspaper, the COVID. So the question was, what important stories that might otherwise have been reported are we not hearing about due to the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of COVID? I think it's a terrific question. Uh, David, you want to kick this one off? You know, this is one of those where I'm going to defend the media here. I mean, if you don't cover this wall to wall, then I don't know what you cover. I mean, this touches every aspect of how we live, how we're going to live, um, whether we change as people, as a society, whether our politics changes, our economy changes. Uh, that's pretty complete. Um, and that said, you know, there's still coverage of other issues. You know, there's a new unity government in Israel. Uh, which has been covered in the Times and in other, in other publications. So it's a question of weight. It's a question of tonnage. And obviously, if you turn on cable news, you know, cable news is about tonnage. It's about one story. And when there is one story, it's to the exclusion of everything else. It's more unusual to see um, the New York Times basically totally taken over by a story like this. But I think here it's appropriate. I think, you know, this is actually an instance where take climate change, which rates high for a lot of people, but is actually difficult to cover. And one of the reasons it's difficult to cover is people say it matters to them, but they really don't, they don't read about it or watch about it on TV. Um, here we're seeing coverage, you know, woven in here. And again, I think one of the things that the Times has done particularly well is not just covered this in terms of what's happening, but by kind of turning the camera on ourselves and saying, who are we and who are we becoming through all of this? I think that's a more first person, modern uh, filter of journalism that's, um, that's a good thing. Elizabeth, thoughts about that? Sure, um, yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. I'm not surprised and I agree with David that um, this is a story of a, of, a, of a lifetime and we have to be all in on it. But there are things we are covering. I mean, it, um, I mean, here's an example I just came to my mind because uh, David Sanger had a, has a story uh, right now on the web saying that you know, t t um, Iran has launched a military satellite and has, Trump tells the Navy we love this to shoot down Iranian gunboats. We were laughing about how you shoot down a boat, but anyway, that's what he said this morning. But that is the, um, <laughs> uh, that is, uh, that would be a big page one story right now. It's not, it's we're covering it, you know, and carefully and trying to figure out what's going on, but we're not, again, I think there's, we are covering Israel as an example, but it's just not big front page news that would be otherwise, you know, the virus has, has pushed everything else out. Now, since we're, uh, since we're in this uh, domain of science, sorry, sorry. we're not covering the campaign. That's what's normally this at this point, there would be a, an all out, you know, political story raging every day. We would be taught we'd be covering um, the, the run up to the Olympics. We'd be talking about the conventions. It's, it's just silence. Right, but but, but the reason we're not is because there's nothing to cover, right? So there is no <laughs> right. right. That's the that's the irony, and that's that's what's truly groundbreaking about you know even um, this is what's really striking to me about in you know, thinking about 9/11, right? I mentioned Elizabeth and I and our experience with 9/11. You know, the biggest story of my lifetime for sure, um, and a real change in kind of who we are, how we think as a country, our position in the world, you name it. Um, a, there was an ability to connect physically to people over that, a sense of community over that, which we are lacking here. Um, and it could only last for so long, as hot and heavy as it was for as long as it was, people just couldn't keep their attention on it. Here, you know, this commands your attention because it's so all encompassing. Now, uh, you know, you're entering into my world in the world of science and in the world of science with the thousands of medical journals, people disagree with each other like crazy just based on how the data comes out. It's not a matter of a, taking a political point of view, at least we hope it's not. We hope it's based on evidence and data. But um, in, any, in any field, uh, my wife's uh, had a career as a very distinguished molecular biologist. 
And she would tell me stories about how one particular uh, ex exhaustive search down a certain trail would lead to a certain conclusion. And then you'd have to turn around and backtrack because it didn't match up with the, your, your hypothesis didn't match the data. So the reason I bring that up is that um, the media is, of course, very understandably hanging on every word about tests of potential treatments for a lethal disease that has no treatment. All we do in hospitals is give supportive care, oxygen, bed rest, heaven forbid, a ventilator, and nothing specific right now. And of course, there's a lot of controversy about things like hydroxychloroquine. And as you see the studies pour in, and they're all small studies so far, there's no definite definitive conclusion on these things. So how do you help decide whether it makes sense, say at the Times or at CNN, to cover every single thing that comes out, even if the experts tell you again and again and again, it's not conclusive. It's not a randomized clinical trial. We just don't know yet. And yet the public, of course, is hanging on every possible word, grabbing every possible straw of hope. How do you decide where to find that balance where you don't swing people's behaviors or swing people's hopes too wildly based on incomplete information? Elizabeth? Uh, well, again, this is something the science uh, section covers more than we do, but we, we get involved. Um, I would just say that we're super uh, careful and skeptical. And I think you, uh, today we have a story actually about uh, Trump's claims on hydroxychloroquine and how um, it just it just hasn't panned out. Now, there's also a caveat here that you can tell me more than I can say this, that there have been no, but these are smaller studies. There's been no wide scale big study and the jury is still out, but we're, you know, we, we treat it with great skepticism. I'd be interested to see what you think. You know, we, we talk to people like you and then, you know, uh, report it out as much as we can, but largely we reviewed it with great skepticism. Well, I'm a cardiologist and uh, hydroxychloroquine can have some bad effects on your heartbeat, on the regularity of your heartbeat. So it's definitely not true that it's a harmless thing. Why not give it a shot kind of thing. But it is true that the studies that have come out recently from Brazil and France and elsewhere and the VA system just in the last 36 hours have failed to show any very good salutary effect and some negative effects enough to just scare you away from it. David, thoughts about the basic question well, that is when we're bouncing around with data? Well, something, part of this is about the modern nature of media. And there's an interesting correlation or um, I would say the New York Times and CNN are very similar in this way. And this is where print slash digital have migrated to the norms of television. This question, this topic is covered in kind of a role. It's a play. It's all a play and it's playing out in front of you. The president gives a briefing and he talks about the benefit of this drug and that same briefing that's covered live. You hear Tony Fauci saying, well, not so fast. And then immediately when it's done, you have a panel of four people, including physicians, who talk about, well, is this a drug that would be useful? What's your experience? And then you might bring on a reporter later. And this goes on and on and on. The New York Times is doing a lot more of that because they have live updates, right? And they're, and they're bullet pointing, in effect, all of their stories. And then they're also, as Elizabeth says, taking a step back and reporting this stuff out. So I, I feel like this is all happening in real time, that the consumption of information is constant and it rolls. It doesn't have a time where it goes dormant and then you pick it back up and then you, you have time to reflect. All of this is a rolling conversation. And there's, especially in the Trump era, it's not unique to the Trump era, but it's accelerated as uh, media has changed, as social media has accelerated, that there's a level of scrutiny about everything right away to challenge uh, claims that are made. Uh, and so I think we go through this kind of rolling period of reporting out these kinds of stories. So your question about how much weight do you give things, I think everything is kind of taken in as raw data and is dissected, and it takes a little bit of time to put it in some greater context. We're living in an age that's not dissimilar, I think, from you know Vietnam, where every day you know you have a ticker of how many people died today and how many cases there are today. It's certainly new in my lifetime. Well, um, I'm going to get on to a bunch of great questions from our fellow congregants, but I want to just give my own opinion on just a couple of things real quickly. Um, I think that uh, I say this with all sincerity, both of the organizations that you work for, 
I think you've done a good job of not only covering the blow by blow, play by play, but stepping back and saying, where are we? And both are beginning to talk about the world after this particular pandemic. And I, for one, think it's incredibly important that we don't try to go back to whatever was business as usual. And one area that's driving me crazy is the fact that we already have roughly 20 million people uninsured in the country in the best of times. Since uh, the Obamacare, it's down to 20 million. And since our country has the major form of health care coverage linked to employment, as millions and millions of people lose their jobs, those who had coverage will lose their coverage. And so the health inequities that are always there anyway are getting multiplied many, many, many fold by these, by these problems. And I like the fact that both of your organizations have begun to cover that. And I hope for whatever this is worth as a suggestion that we begin to save a little tiny bit of space, headspace, to think about what we're going to do next and how we cannot be in this pickle again, because it'll happen again. So here's some great questions from our congregants. Let me pick a couple of interesting ones here. So um, you mentioned about uh, we would normally be uh, thinking about politics in the campaign. And then you said, basically, what, what campaign is that? And in follow up to that, someone asks, with all the coverage Trump gets on the coronavirus, is that putting Biden at a distinct disadvantage? Thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, um, I think it puts him at a disadvantage in that, you know, when you're running against an incumbent, it's always hard. And the president has the bully pulpit and, uh, and President Trump certainly has that. So for, for Biden to kind of uh, extend his reach on this topic and other topics becomes difficult. I do think there's been so many problems with the way that Trump has handled this. The fact that he's lied about certain things, the fact that he's just demonstrably wrong about other things, evaluating his performance uh, provides a, a stark contrast that Biden will definitely seek to exploit. And if, you know, we're just in such unusual circumstances, if you talk about kind of, um, you know, rallying the base on the Democratic side, again, if you're not excited about getting rid of Trump as a Democrat, under these circumstances, I don't know what's going to do it for you, even if you think Biden's not the perfect person. But I think that there's no question, you know, what the, I think Trump makes a lot of mistakes. I think one of the mistakes that he's making is that the presidency is special. He, he thinks it's just like every day you command the airwaves. When the president speaks, it should be special. He's actually diminishing what's special about what he can do. And he's getting himself into more and more trouble. So I think Biden has certain disadvantages in terms of raising money in terms of competing with his profile, but I think as a referendum on the president and, and you know, contrast, I think that uh, the president's doing a lot of that job for him. Elizabeth, any thoughts about this? Or I thought you mind, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the, the polls kind of show what David just said, which I believe as well. You know, at the beginning of this crisis, Trump's uh, approval rating actually went up because there's the rally around the flag aspect. We've all talked about that when there's a crisis that American public usually rallies around the president, no matter who the president is. In this case, has, he's sunk in the last month or so. And um, it is now his approval rating on handling the virus is negative. That more people think he's doing a bad job than doing a good job on the virus. And that has happened as these briefings have unfolded every day. I think the fact that people watch them and that they've got big viewership does not necess necessarily mean they're good for Trump. I mean, I think people sometimes watch them like car wrecks, you know, because there's, you know, you see stuff in that briefing you've never seen before in, in, in the history of the White House, which is the incredible bullying of reporters. You know, it's, um, it's an ugly reality show and people tune in. Um, so, uh, and, you know, I, the original idea was to have Pence out there and to have the experts out and, but Trump, um, you know, misses his rallies. I mean, people at the White House tell us that, and he, these are the rallies that he, he used to go to, you know. And um, you know, and we we had a story last week or so, I, I, quoting a number of Republicans on the record saying these are not good for Trump, you know. Um, but, but he keeps doing it. He and you know, the other thing that's weird is in terms of diminishing the presidency. It's so weird when you see him there. And he kind of like when when Fauci speaks or Deborah Burks or the um, the head of the FDA, the president of the United States then sort of stands back. This is just, just this etiquette you've never seen before, where he kind of like 
leaves and, and like he's the host. It's just, you just don't see that. It's really, um, it, David, I mean, think of another president doing that. It's just so bizarre. So, like, again, it's, just so bizarre. it's just, again, it makes him little, it makes him small. It, I, I mean, he introduces people like it's a Dean Martin roast, you know, uh, Tony. Yeah, it's like, I think of him, it's like an actor. Yeah, like an yeah. after dinner speaker yeah. at the Kiwanis Club, you know. <laughs> anyway, are we on the record? I shouldn't be saying But there's, I, a, you just like, there's a flip yeah. side to this too, which I think we have to bear in mind, which is people see different things when they see these briefings, when they see the president in action. I think as journalists, we know this and we have to we have to have a lot of humility about what we're not seeing in that, you know in the uh, you know, the fourth estate or as some would consider us fifth columnists, right, David? I mean, so um, people are seeing different things in the president's reaction. And I think we have to allow for that, that they may see, uh, again, taking on reporters and, and uh, even hurling insults and all of that. You know, we don't like it. We think it's the presidency and on and on and on. There's plenty of people who do like it, or at least are not going to be mortally offended by it. And that's the part we don't know. I mean, I agree with Elizabeth that under these circumstances, you could see a, an upside for the president that would be much higher. Um, again, if he had a more like a, a Vice President Pence kind of temperament. Um, but he's a divisive figure, and we don't know how all of that's going to play out. We know that, um, uh, you know, that, that there are just built in disadvantages for Biden in this moment. Um, he's hopeful that he will just look better by, by comparison. No, to, we did a, uh, to, we to, did a, uh, just to finish, we, um, sure. uh, Annie Carney did a story about, uh, we had national reporters all over the country sit with Trump, you know, Trump supporters, independents, and people who don't support Trump and watch the briefing, a couple of briefings with them. And we found that the Trump supporters thought they were fantastic. They looked forward to them. It was reassuring. It's uh, just to echo what David said that I think it's a, the Rorschach test. People see in them what they want. And, um, Certainly his supporters like them. You know, you can sort of hear him speaking to them. So. Speaking, of a, speaking of a Rorschach test and thinking of the political lens uh, through which people are seeing things, um, long, before, long before the coronavirus, um, the public was losing its confidence in science, losing its uh, trust in science, as it has in many, many things. And uh, one of the areas that's been frightening for me is people losing their confidence in the concept of vaccination. And uh, some of this came from a 1998 Lancet article that said that there was this very tight link between autism and vaccination. That turned out to be a fraudulent article. The author was stripped of his medical license. The article was retracted. A big study subsequently published showed there was no relationship. But you know, errata and retractions are yesterday's news. They're very, very hard to come across with. So one of our colleagues, one of our fellow congregants asked the question, um, how can the media do a better job convincing some segments of the population that the news is not fake? And I'm raising that in this context because for a long time, people have been skeptical about certain aspects of science because science is ever changeable. There's never a, 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 an answer that is the last answer you're gonna have. There's always the next question to be asked. So I think there's a certain built-in skepticism. We've told people for generations that it's uh, very, very important to never have a, a drop of fat, to have non-fat milk, non-fat yogurt, never touch an egg. And then a few years ago, we said, well, you know, it's okay. An egg is all right. And, you know, low fat might be okay. Some whole milk might be okay. You can understand that people would get whiplash from the way science works. So help us if there are people who, through a political lens or whatever, are thinking, well, that point of view is, I don't agree with it. It must just be a lie. It must be fake news in either direction. What can the media do, if anything, to help people have more confidence that the news is just reported dispassionately as what is and isn't all politically motivated? What can you do to help? That's the question. That's a tough one. Um, That's a tough one. I, uh, I get that question all the time. Um, and, um, you know, there's not, uh, we, can't, we can't, you know, we can't make people read us, but we what we do at the new york times is which cnn does you you don't you don't you um we become much more transparent i think in our reporting you know you you washington post for example you see these crazy formulations that you know you know this article was based on you know interviews with 17 people at the white house you know to let people know these are real sources we are we don't we're not allowed at the new york times to um 
uh, use background quotes, you know, use quotes, put somebody's quotations and in, in quote marks and say, according to a senior administration official. So there's, there's tougher standards. Um, we do have to use some background sources on some things, but we're not allowed to quote them directly. Um, so there are some, um, we try to be, again, just more uh, open about how we do our journalism. Um, uh, you'll notice that it's this weird thing. We, the Times now has photos of people on the, on the articles online. This is to show you that we are real people. I mean, mm -hmm. we found out years ago that, or actually maybe five years ago, that um, people didn't know anything about datelines. If it said um, Jakarta or, or Jerusalem, people reading the newspaper or the web didn't necessarily think that, we, that the Times had anybody there. You know, um, so we've just learned a lot about being much more transparent about uh, how we do our journalism inside the, we have these inside the Times stories now, which, it's, yes. you know, yes. we have reporters talking about how they got the story and what they did, and it's all first person. I mean, I, I think it's good. It's just very different from the way I was, um, uh, you know, brought up at the, at, you know, the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. We didn't do such things back in those well, you days. Know, this is, you know, David, I think, one of the problems in the question, frankly, is uh, is the premise that somehow the media is one thing and the media has the ability to somehow disabuse certain people of certain things. That's the fallacy. Mm -hmm. If you haven't noticed, our politics is incredibly tribal and polarized. Um, and so is our media. And there's lots of reasons for that. There's tremendous bias in our media, even in our great sources. I mean, the problem is that there's always, there are points of view, there are sensibilities, there are judgments that they're made. Um, and then people exploit, you know, people have been going after the media forever, you know, politicians especially. So they have done a lot to try to, to uh, diminish the credibility of the media. The, re the upshot of all of this is that it's individuals who have to scrutinize themselves and try to figure out, oh, this thing I saw on Facebook is actually fake. It's actually not true. Uh, but this thing over here is true. So, I mean, I agree with Elizabeth that what you do is, and you have to do it in an increasingly transparent way. Mm -hmm. Look, in cable news, I think it's a bigger problem than um, you know, uh, a digital platform like, um, if you don't mind me calling the New York Times a digital platform now, you guys are so great digitally. <laughs> uh, and you're probably a bigger digital presence than you are a print presence. Um, there's absolutely a sensibility at CNN. There's no question about it. And, it, it, you know, everybody picks it. Now, if you agree with it, then you think it's great. It's straight ahead. But it's, it's, it's competing in a marketplace of ideas and points of view. It's not, you know, the idea. Now, you would say, yeah, well, it's enlightened and it's calling the president out on these things. But I, I think the point is that individuals have to try to discern, you know, what's real and who you can trust. You know, I think it's an interesting moment in time right now where out of all of this, there's Anthony Fauci, you know, who is kind of beyond reproach, even though there's quarters of people who are talking about firing Fauci and this, that and the other. You know, what we all strive for as, as media entities, as journalists, is to be beyond reproach and to be seen as credible. But we've been too beaten up to exist without some pockmarks on us. And we have to fight through that, which is why we have to be more transparent about, well, this is how we got to the story. So people will, will see past that. But I think it's just very hard for the media to do the business of disabusing people of, uh, of misconceptions uh, in this political climate. In fact, uh, my own opinion based only on, on observation, not on any data, is that I think it's part of the reason I believe journalism is a dangerous profession right now, even if you're not in a war zone. But that's just a personal point of view. About transparency and the little pictures that Elizabeth uh, discussed, which I love seeing those little thumbnail pictures, they're great. Um, someone asks, uh, Elizabeth, can you tell us about Don McNeil, the Times science reporter? Is he a doc? Is he a scientist? Can you give us a little quick pricey about Don? No, I don't. I don't actually know him because he's been in the science department for years, and I've been down here for years. But um, he wrote a really good. I mean, I don't know uh, his background. I don't think he's a doctor. I don't think he's a scientist. I think he's just been covering it for many decades and knows it really well, and knows a lot of doctors and scientists. And I think his piece on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday last weekend, it was really, really good about how this might look. Um, I mean, he's been pretty. Um, 
pretty uh, gloomy about this whole thing, I would say. He's <laughs> not a real positive. Um, and um, so, I mean, that was a, kind of a dark story, I'll say, but um, I really respect his work and uh, I read every single word, obviously. So again, I don't know, I could, if you go online, it should say, we, there's a little, bio, this part of the transparency, we have a little bio, biography, biographies of everybody online now, so. I've been reading the thing that I, I wanted to point out to people that I think is so important, you know, if you're interested in, in, in particularly about the Times, the thing that's in my experience and in my judgment is different about the New York Times than anywhere else is that love them or hate them, you do business with them uh, because they are the newspaper of record. And so think about Trump, you know, like I, I have this line I've always said, which is that, that Donald Trump will never quit Maggie Haberman because he knows <laughs> her respects her, he may hate her. But in the end, the paper he read growing up and he wants the New York Times to see him as legitimate. And so he will never not pay attention to that. And the truth is everybody feels that way, even if they write about it. So what's special about, I don't know Don, but what's special about any of these beat reporters with the Times, and it's not just the Times, but people who spent a long period of time, mm -hmm. is that they have the benefit of long-term relationships. You know, people who, um, uh, actually the profile of the New Yorker of, uh, I'm forgetting who uh, wrote that, maybe Elizabeth remembers. Oh, Fauci is interesting because these are people who covered oh, Fauci. Yeah, it's such a great piece. Who was it? Who wrote it? Who, who wrote it? It's uh, Michael Spector. Yeah, right. Anyway, he covered him during the AIDS uh, business too. So, you know, the, the epidemic. So, I think, you know, what lends credibility to reporters is the ability to develop relationships over time with all kinds of people where your expertise is in part about those relationships where there's such a deep reservoir of trust that you're getting really good information. Yeah, and I certainly agree with your point of view about the Times. Although, even though I know the data support your assertion that the digital readership is bigger than the print, I'm old school. I still think of the Times as the gray lady that that'll never change for me. <laughs> um, so here's a here's a. Can I, can I just say something? Yeah. The um, the especially these days, print is basically a digest of the web. There is so much more on the web um, than is available on the little package that arrives at your doorstep every morning. So, and our readership on the web is um, uh, is huge right now, partly because it's all the virus coverage is free. So we're having a huge renaissance on the web right now. But um, so I would just like to say. Uh, I mean, I was, I'm a grew up in print as well, but there's a lot more on the web right now. Yeah, yep, for sure, for sure. I'm gonna eventually go with the times. Um, so here's an interesting question that sort of follows our conversation from one of our colleagues. Do major media organizations have the resources to effectively cover COVID issues if it continues for months and months and months, as well as important local media who have far less resources? So the question is, what's the capacity financial human resource and so on to cover something that shows no particular signs that it's going to go away totally. I personally think from my reading of the epidemiology that we are going to have a backlash again in the fall. And so what's the answer? It's a great question. Do we have the resources to keep this up? Yeah, I'm really glad we got to this because I think this is really, really interesting and it's, it's, it's pretty alarming. So take um, CNN or take all, all the networks. One of the problems right now is that our usage um, viewers, people who are watching or reading content is through the roof. The problem is the advertising has totally dried up. Yeah. So what do you need? You need subscribers. And this is where the Times, and Elizabeth can speak to this, has done a great job financially migrating, you know, adapting to that environment to where they are big enough and they would have always been big enough to withstand this. So CNN is interesting because, you know, AT&T is not doing well, the owner of CNN. CNN's viewership is through the roof and the costs are relatively low. You know, the way we're doing this tonight, this is how I appear on CNN in the morning or in the evening. It's just in this exact spot that I'm in right now over, it's not Zoom, it's a different platform. It's Cisco WebEx, which they did this deal with. Um, and I'm sure they got a good deal because they're getting so much promotion out of it, Cisco is. Mm -hmm. But the usage is really high. The advertising has dried up. So if you are NBC and you're MSNBC, Comcast has subscribers, cable subscribers. They, can, they get a lot of money from that. On NBC, the, the revenue is dried up. Comcast has theme parks. Disney has theme parks. There's no money there. 
the streaming services, you know, um, obviously Netflix with 16 million uh, new subscribers uh, last month. I mean, they're going through the roof, but this is what's going to happen. Local news organizations, I think my wife made this observation, and I think it's true. This is accelerating changes that were already happening. We've, we're seeing a death in local news operations. We're seeing, a, you know, a, a broadcast news operations have been losing money uh, in, in a lot of sectors for a long time. So really it's Darwinian. Um, you know, some of your favorite sources, a good friend of mine who runs Vox Media, you know, they're struggling and having some layoffs if they're dependent upon an advertising model. That's what's suffering right now. You gotta have people who are, you know, giving you money or subscribing to what you do. You know, uh, just a quick aside before I go on to the next question. Uh, David, you and I met when I was secretary of the Smithsonian yeah. um, in that wonderful office in the castle. And one of the reasons that that position was so life-changing and such a growth experience every single day was that you had the gamut of human knowledge there. There was a lot of science, there was humanities, arts of all kinds, and so on. And um, I wonder whether the uh, the extreme focus on science, which we have to be doing now, we absolutely have to be doing, is going to further shove the arts and humanities to the back seat and take us away from those aspects that that really make us uh, more fully human. Uh, and I'm saying that as a scientist. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Are we at risk for um, for walking even farther away from anything that's not STEM based? I'll let Elizabeth go first on that. Uh, well, no, I think, uh, uh, no, I mean, I, right now there's no plays, there's no, there's no movies, there is no ballet, there's no, there's no arts that we cover, there's no museums. But uh, I, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think we actually, I think we should cover more of it in the future than we do. I mean, the science section comes out um, and health and science comes out one day a week. You know, I think that going in the future, we should cover more than we have in the past. Um, I think we, we over, I mean, I love all the coverage, but I think we focus much more on, um, again, um, you know, on the humanities than we do on science. Uh, my son's a, a mathematician he's working on his PhD in math and we we don't we don't cover that world much you know uh, we don't we don't cover medicine enough so that's what I think but I, but I don't honestly but, but I don't honestly think that's going to change a presupposition change I think one of the one of the realities that we're facing is that as journalists um, we cover the big story mm -hmm. and then we cover the last war obsessively you know, 9-11 impacted our country and our journalism for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, this will as well. But what we ought to be doing in journalism is really hard because we are commercial enterprises, which is what don't we know? What's the threat that we're not talking about? Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. If we're not talking about it, you don't want to read about it. And the New York Times has the ability, even more than the cable networks, trust me, to put something on the agenda and say, this is big. Most people in journalism don't have that. And this is why I think there's, uh, George Packer has a great piece on The Atlantic now about you know, how the, the virus exposed a kind of decaying American society. And part of his argument is that you know, government was defunded and things weren't thought about, but you know, We've heard these arguments before. It's very difficult to put issues on the agenda of the American people uh, out of nowhere if there's not a crisis. Um, you know, it just doesn't happen if there isn't political will for that. And I think that's the issue. You can say, oh, we're going to be covering science all the time now because of this pandemic. No, you know what people are wanting to do? They want to never hear the word coronavirus again. They'll be so tired of it. They want to move on. The job of journalists in the political class is to say, hey, wait a minute, we have to think about the stuff that you don't want to think about. We got to prepare for that and establish a political will for that. That's really hard. Well, here's one. Here's one I hope you'll think about. When you think about people's health, uh, of 100% of our health, about 20% roughly, we say, is due to genetics. About 20% is related to people in white coats. And about 60% is what's your zip code? What's your, what are the social determinants of health? There's a way to bring together the social sciences 
the humanities and science going forward. And we're seeing the results of the social determinants and the unbelievable uh, effects this pandemic is having on vulnerable populations. Back to the list here. We got a big list, you guys. I hope you're feeling your oats tonight because we got a lot of questions coming up here. Now, here's one. I've seen one story about the lack of a unified and orderly approach to finding a vaccine. How will this story be covered as time unfolds? Do you know how science journals cover incremental advances in science research? David Gregory just described a rolling conversation. Is this how it will be with the development of vaccine? Great question. I think David just said yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll cover the, it's like any news development. We will cover them as, you know, big, big breakthroughs as they happen, as soon as we can learn about them. And then we'll do, I mean, this is not my area. Then we'll do big step back pieces. I mean, I thought it was a fabulous piece about the race and all the countries competing, you know, but um, uh, I, I, you know, we'll cover it um, the way we cover any kind of news development, which is, which is, you know, which is uh, thoroughly and carefully and hopefully we get it first, you know, and uh, aggressively. That's all I can tell you. I'm not a science uh, editor or reporter, as you can tell. So, um, uh, Elizabeth actually has a microscope in her home. I've seen it. It's huge. It's a huge microscope. <laughs> um, you know, the truth is, of course, Elizabeth is right. The difference here is the, the spotlight is so big on this topic. Mm -hmm. So what happens in society is we all, and, and it really starts, I mean, it's true throughout society, but the political class and then the, the journalistic class, the, the, the aperture widens to the point where we're all having this conversation and we've learned so much that now it becomes a house, it becomes, uh, you know, people are talking about um, scientific terms, for example, or scientific concepts. They're, they're household concepts now. People are having these conversations at dinner because we're learning a lot. So I think what's different about the race for the vaccination here is that it's happening right in front of everybody and it's absolutely front page news because it's that vital. And so what happens is that when you have stories that somehow emerge from the shadows and they become all that anybody's talking about, it's like the vaccine and the third season of Ozark, it has broken through and everybody's talking about it. So yeah, it becomes a rolling conversation. You'll have, you know, the nature of television slash social media today is such that everything is a constant conversation and this will be topic A and it'll all, all of it will be um, covered inch by inch. And then you'll rely on good exploratory journalism to try to give you, you know, bigger context. And you know, the vaccine, just to support what you're both saying, the vaccine I think will be a very important rolling conversation because vaccines are not one and done. Think about the flu vaccine. The virus mutates and there's, it's not clear yet whether the coronavirus is gonna mutate like influenza mutates, but we're gonna to have to keep, keep up with nature. As, as one of my uh, medical school professors said when talking about mutation, that we make a better mouse trap and then nature makes a better mouse. So that's, that's one of those old things. You do get to a certain age, you remember all those aphorisms that you paid so much tuition to hear. Now, um, here's one. Um, getting back to the idea that Elizabeth mentioned, and you did as well, David, that normally we'd be going crazy with coverage of a hard fought campaign. Maybe we would still be covering Democratic side, who knows. Someone asks, how much attention and in what forms do you see coverage of various voter suppression efforts getting in the coming months, especially with so much emphasis on COVID? In other words, are, are we going to miss coverage of those kinds of things that are central to the health and safety of the Republic? I don't think so. I mean, we covered the Wisconsin primary pretty extensively, and I think that we'll continue to do that. I mean, we are sending reporters out, you know, when there's an important story. I mean, that, you know, with, you know, with masks and so forth. And, but um, I, I don't expect anyone to, uh, to shy away from that. Um, and, uh, you know, again, Wisconsin was a really classic example. Of you know, there's a presumption yeah. in the question, if you allow me, there's a presumption in the question that somehow the media will affect the course of these things. And again, this is where I want you to, I want to kind of push back on that. Um, the New York Times, even more than CNN, has infinite resources. 
Uh, they have correspondents who cover politics who are not getting on the front page as much because there's not as much to cover, but they're out there doing their work and they'll do this work. The question really is about, um, will, they, will these topics break through? Will they somehow be hidden? And I think the answer is no, because I think this question of how we're going to vote in the fall is really big. And it is gonna be a big political fight and it's something that will be well covered, but the media is not going to be the resolution and people will look for us to, to shine a light on it, which we will and we should, but this is going to be, um, you know, we're in the middle of something that has the potential to really change a lot of who we are. And we've been through this before um, uh, in, in other crises. And, what, and, and what's hard as we sit here tonight is what the other side looks like. And right now, the other side looks like November and how we vote. What does that look like? And no, I think it'll be well covered. Um, would you guys agree, Elizabeth and David, that the rabbi gets to jump the queue, that if the rabbi put a question in, I get to move him to the top of the list? Yes. Would you agree with that? Okay. Yes, of course. So I just noticed this when I mentioned about the arts and humanities, Rabbi Zemel said religion is an art form. And um, I, I want to acknowledge that. And I want to just take a little digression for a moment. Um, David, your book, uh, How's Your Faith, was actually very moving for me. I, I also um, am a very happy member of an interfaith marriage, and I thought your thing was just uh, terrific. And Elizabeth, I don't know you well enough to know um, that, that aspect of, of your life and your sensibilities, but here we are in the tabernacle tonight. If you will. I, I get muted. I'm in an interfaith marriage as well. So, 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 the, so the tabernacle question for tonight is, whatever your uh, connection, whatever the dance you do with Judaism, is it playing into your work? Is, is your Judaism or your faith in general mixed up with your work or is it something sort of off to the side? Either, either one of you. Well, I think that it's, um, it, it's, it's more that it's, uh, it's mixed up in our lives, you know, in, in terms of who we are and, and uh, how we bring our best selves. Um, you know, in the immediate form to, you know, all of us who are in our homes with our families um, and uh, with creating all kinds of new routines. Um, the absence of community, which I think is really hard right now and how we have patience and compassion and try to see what we can't actually see. Um, and I think that's a, a piece of it. So understanding the divisions that are out there um, and how how do we try to um, incorporate in our coverage and our journalism and on our analysis um, the people that we're not seeing all the time and um, uh, trying to keep in mind kind of the broader community. So I think for me at least, um, there's a daily sense of gratitude about all the ways that, uh, um, that, that I'm able to deal with this, uh, that other people are not, that other people in my family, my extended family are not shielded from um, this crisis. I think that's a starting point for me. Beautiful. Elizabeth, any thoughts? Uh, well, all I can say, I mean, I'm not Jewish. Uh, my husband is, uh, we raised our children as Rabbi Zemel knows, we raised both of our children at Temple Micah. Um, and um, so I think the one, I would say the one, uh, I don't think I'm Episcopalian. I member across the street at National Cathedral, which is convenient. Um, and uh, one of my, um, uh, I am on the Flower Guild at National Cathedral, which people find very strange, but um, I'm not doing it right now, obviously, because there's no services, but um, um, it's sort of a nice change from what I do during most of the rest of the day. Um, so the only thing I can say is that the one sort of event, uh, social, virtual social event we had recently was when we had a, um, we participated in two um, Zoom seders um, the same night, uh, one with the wise, extended Wiseman family and our kids um, uh, all over the um, country and another one with some friends and that was all over the world. And I found those, um, I actually found it very lovely. Um, the, the Wiseman family seder was, um, was the first time we'd actually participated in the Seder with the California Wisemans that, they, you know, my, my, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it was really fun. I mean, it was, we never would have done that otherwise. So, um, uh, you know, and I really, really liked that. And then, um, we didn't do much on Easter, but, you know, so that's all so, I can say. I, I don't really, you know, and, and I have to say, how do I say this at the times, um, um, 
I'd say this carefully, knowing a lot about Jewish culture, I don't know what the whole Jewish way is important. It helps the New York Times, let's put it that way. Um, you know, um, it's just, uh, there's a lot of Jews who work at the New York Times and um, it's just because of the New York and, you know, uh, it's, um, I've always been very, it's just part of my life, you know, and it's part of my life at work too, just the sort of the, the cultural Judaism. Is that right? I don't know if I said the right thing, but. I think you did. I think you said well, the right thing for sure. I, I think um, what, one of the things that I that I have found, and I think a lot of people have found, is, um, is something that Rabbi Zemel talks a lot about, which is about um, the thickness of our relationships. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, you know, I mean, the Israelites had to go, you know, through exile uh, to understand, you know, as, as the Psalms say about if I should ever forget Jerusalem, you know, may my right hand wither. And I think that sometimes when we go through these experiences, just the, just the desire for human connection, the fact that Zoom has taken off the way it has, the way that we just don't want to pick up a phone, we want to FaceTime. We want to Zoom people because we want to be reminded of the thickness of our relations. Um, there's a gift in that through crisis, if you can see it. And, uh, and I think in that way, um, our, our faith and our, um, and our sense of, uh, you know, our I and thou relationships, that we, that we need each other and that we rely on each other, we rely on that sense of connection will be strengthened on the other side of this. And of course, we all walk through kind of sleepwalking through our lives, but we're not reminded of this. Um, and uh, unfortunately, painful periods like this can remind us of that. And you know, I have to give a little thank you. I know you'll share with me to Rabbi Zemel, the other rabbis, and Deborah Winter for making it possible for us to have these online uh, services and online discussions and webinars. It's a great feeling of community at a time where I think it'd be pretty easy to become isolated. Um, sticking a little bit um, with the uh, Judaica um, string of questions, a question came up, what about the anti-Semitism that appears to be rising its head again in this pandemic? And I've uh, been reading uh, Deborah Lipstadt's uh, latest book on, called Anti-Semitism Here and Now. And um, of course, this book was written way before uh, the uh, coronavirus. But any thoughts about that, about uh, anti-Semitism right now and its link? I think the, the, the background historical uh, reference, of course, could be the Black Plague and uh, in uh, centuries gone by and whether Jews were responsible for that and so on and so forth. Any thoughts about that, either one of you? Anti-Semitism in the face of coronavirus? Well, I think, you know, one of the issues that we have to come to grips with is um, in a time of crisis and especially a time of economic depression, um, it, it further tears the social fabric apart. And we've already experienced this going back to the financial collapse of 2008. Yes. You know, uh, Beth and I were having a conversation earlier about, I just read a terrific book by um, uh, Steve uh, Karaki at uh, MSNBC about uh, the red and the blue about the 90s politics and why Pop Buchanan only had uh, so much of a voice uh, back in the 90s and then Donald Trump ultimately becomes president. And I think there's lots of answers to that. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with economics and about the changes in our, in our economy. And I think when that happens, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who are blaming others. And I think Jews are always susceptible to that. So, you know, I think there's a lot that's coursing through the country right now. And we're not, I go back to the fact that we're not seeing it. We're kind of looking through the looking glass. We're reading kind of excellent reporting, but we're, we are like necessarily separated from some of the ruin that's going on in the country. And then we're going to come to grips with that. And I think there's going to be some ugliness. I agree. Elizabeth, any thoughts about that? About anti-Semitism no, yeah. right now? Or I'll, I, my, the only thing I would say is I have been, like everyone, horrified by the anti-Semitism that's, that's become so much more prevalent that in, in American society. It's you know, starting from Charlottesville on. And um, it's frightening. Um, you know, Steve, my husband always said, you know, it, it, you know, we when we first were married, I used to be, um, you know, expressing surprise that there he would say there's still anti-Semitism in New York. And but I was obviously living in a different world. And I 
become educated and aware since then. And certainly during this during this administration, it's quite frightening. I would, might add, I would always like to say this that um, uh, my mother is Danish. I was born in Denmark, and my mother was Danish and was in Denmark during the war, um, Second World War. And so um, I'm always very proud to say that um, you know the Danes were the, were the Danes. Denmark was the one country that you know stood up to Hitler and saved the Jews and stuff. So. I've been to Elsinore and then I've seen the spots uh, where the Jews took the boats across to Sweden. It's very moving. Mm. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> Elizabeth, <laughs> you're from uh, Alborg, right? We're in Alborg, yes. Yeah, I have uh, some <laughs> colleagues at the great university in Alborg. It's quite a, quite a university, just fantastic. Well, believe it or not, um, we have been through in one form or another all the questions that our colleagues have thrown at us. And so before we turn it back to uh, Rabbi Zemel. Any last minute thoughts uh, for our fellow congregants and, and for anybody else who may be watching this webinar tonight before we give it back to the rabbi? Elizabeth, any last last thoughts? I just wanna thank people for um, for reading and their support. It's, um, it's un again, it's unusual to be, um, uh, it's, it's a little weird to get praise for what we, you know, to be <laughs> thanks for what we do, um, but I really appreciate it. and. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, I, I just really appreciate it. You know, it's nice to feel like we're needed. David. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's well said. And, you know, just thinking about everybody in the community, especially those people who may feel lonely um, and uh, who are in need in any way. And I hope as a community, um, as, as I know we've been doing it, if, if we can all rally together to, to help people who have any, uh, uh, particular needs. But I, I think these kinds of events are important and just bring community together. So we're reminded of, uh, of um, what we share as a community. This is, this is a hard thing. And I guess, you know, what I worry about is that we almost adapt to um, the separation and that we lose that rhythm in our life that's dependent upon um, gathering together out of fear. It's very odd, you know, to go for a run and be, you know, almost irritated by people who are too close to you, right? I mean, it's just not what we're about as a, as a community, as Jews, as people of faith generally, whether we're Jews, Christians, or others. And um, we got to work hard to, uh, to hold those, uh, all those bonds together. Well, I think the world's a better place with you two characters in it. So I thank you very, very much for doing this tonight and for all you do every day. Thanks. And um, Rabbi Zemel, turning it back to you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you to all of you. It was just been a wonderful, wonderful evening. And um, uh, David just said the world is a better place. Maybe for better place for in it. In it. Uh, I, I'd uh, like to say that I think um, our community is a richer in. Um, I would say perhaps even um, uh, a thicker place uh, for having you. And it's a thank you so, so much. And for the last several years on, um, I forget, either Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, I've, I've been asking journalists in the congregation to, um, to stand up so we can thank you for, for, for the work you do. Um, I'd like to thank you for the work you do. You represent, uh, the two of you represent a, a world of journalists and, and uh, uh, you're, you're doing such important work at this time. Uh, I listened especially, I was listening closely, there were two words that were used that I, that I kept coming back to. You both used the word transparency, and then you both used the word light. I'm not a physicist, but I think um, transparency is either a function of light or light is a function of transparency. There is a relationship between them. And I then thought of Psalm 97, where in Psalm 97 we read, Or Zarua la tzaddik, light is sown for the righteous. But I'd like to twist that a little bit this evening before we end it. I think or Zaru Alat Sadiq, light is sown for the righteous. But I think in the case of journalists, light is also being sown by the righteous. So thank you so, so much for shining a light on what's happening in our world. We are all stronger for it. So I'll end just with a short prayer. Baruch Ataronai Yotzer Haor. Blessed are you, our God, creator of light. And now what I love to say, Deborah, bring us home. <laughs>
Light is sown for the righteous, and the honest person uh, is given the gift of happiness. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you, David and David and Elizabeth. Um, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you in person. Where <laughs> make our strong relationship even thicker. Good yeah. night, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi Zell. Thank you, David and David and Deborah. Thank you, Temple Micah. <laughs>